Hello, I'm Laura Cassidy from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from the American Chemical Society Spring 2019 National Meeting in Orlando. We're joined today by Dr. Sadia Avrik from the Allegheny Health Network Research Institute. He's studying next generation single dose antidotes for opioid overdoses. Dr. Avrik? Good morning. Uh so uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. So one of the major problems that we've been found in recent years, especially in the States, is the rise of the synthetic opioids, such as fentanyl, carfentanil, and the related ilk. And what we found is that the, these, well, it's been known in literature, is that these drugs are very long-lasting compared to the traditional uh, abused agonists, uh, such as morphine and heroin. And uh, doses and antidotes like Narcan have not been able to last long enough, apart from the potency of these dr uh, drugs, the circulatory lifetimes just far exceed that of other other materials. And what we've really, what, what, and that's really led to a major spike in deaths. And so the problem was inspired by, the next slide, um, um, the, uh, uh, the the uh, agonists, so the antagonists, the things that you give to reverse an overdose, things like Narcan uh, or naltrexone, and even these uh, newer drugs like nalmethine, uh, their ability to be rapidly metabolized by the liver, whereas fentanyl and the hi other hydrophobic antagonists can get uh, agonists get sequestered into the adipose tissue, therefore having a uh, sort of a reservoir that leaches out as the other uh, material gets met as the antidote gets metabolized. And part of the problem is you, uh, giving large doses of um, antagonists, of antidotes, can lead to a phenomenon known as precipitated opioid withdrawal. So that really inspired the research of how do you have a very a, a different drug delivery system where you can get linear uh, release of antagonists from a, a depot of material with, uh, to last long enough to overcome a fentanyl or, or synthetic opioid overdose. And so that's led us to our um, um, to our um, drug delivery system that, we uh, that we've uh, begun to testing of c taking the naloxone, incorporating to the chain end of a polymer, and then having it slowly be released over time um, after injection, so you have a very nice linear long-acting release. And with our system, we're able to control a lot of the drug's proper, the material properties, release rate, and drug loading to sort of have a very customizable but yet very robust drug delivery system for fighting the opioid crisis. So, Thank you, Dr. Avrik. Are there any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Hello, it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. So um, my question is about the mechanism of the drug delivery. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a polymer, I'm assuming, is it some kind of enzyme attack? And does that mean that different individuals might react differently in a sense to the polymer conjugate so that you know it the rate of release would actually differ for different people so that's that's a that's a real concern so the the, the release rate is based upon enzymatic hydrolysis and aqueous hydro, uh, hydro, hydrolysis of the of the ester bond between the naloxone and the lactic acid that could be tuned depending on which polymer that we're using. Right now, we're using lactic acid. We're switch to a different polymer, like polyglycolic acid. You have inherently faster uh, aqueous hydrolysis rates. Um, but there is a certain base level in the endogenous tissue of the enzymes of concern. So it's um, you would you would still you would be we would have to screen a larger range of polymers in conditions in uh, more advanced animal models that we've tested to determine where the uh, what the optimal formulation would be to get a certain dose. Uh, so what we're trying to achieve is <coughs> sorry, about an 8 nanogram per milliliter dose of naloxone in the, in the blood, and that's been shown to be able to reverse a fentanyl overdose. So as long as you know the parameters are to achieve at least that dose within a therapeutic window, in a, we should be able to move forward with a, a more advanced testing and formulation. Is that a, a, a higher dose than you would give by repeated injection then? It's actually going to be uh, somewhat lower. So what happens is, is in a lot of times with an overdose, if um, You'll, people won't respond to one or two doses of Narcan, so you'll try to bur uh, you'll you'll try to titrate and give them. Well, ti well, you won't titrate. You'll just dump more naloxone into the person, which can then lead to them having enough naloxone to sort of ride out the the opioids in their system, but put them into the precipitated withdrawal state. So it's a very hard it's a very hard balance to have enough naloxone to last long enough to prevent renarcotization, without actually causing a lot of other uh, issues, and potentially that leads to patients not wanting to go into rehab eventually because of the negative effects associated with the precipitated withdrawal. And so that's also a fairly big concern. Uh, that's one thing I was sort of going to ask, just leading on from this. Um, 
could it potentially be, could the technology be adapted in any way to stop people from becoming addicted to these as a sort of preventive? Um, you, 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 we are imagining a role for, the, for different formulations uh, to actually last long, uh, longer and give broader coverage. Um, and the lack of bursts for these kinetics that from these particles. So normally when you're making a drug delivery the nanoparticle, you'll take a drug, compound it with polymer, mix it together, and then precipitate them. So what we're doing by incorporating the polymer into the chain end, um, it, you'll get a very different release profile, whereas the first system you'll get a burst release and then a linear, and then a more linear release, which can actually induce precipitate withdrawal. Here we can get a more linear, clean release to have a more a constant dose, which m may be useful in the context of addiction, but that's a very separate question because there's a, been a push to using things like Suboxone um, because there's a bit of, there's buprenorphine in there to give a bit of an ag agonist activity to help. So we're actually looking at those systems as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Bela Buslag, ACS. Um, the polymer itself, the naloxone polymer, uh, how big is it? Uh, the, so we are, it's 15% weight of its naloxone. It's about a molecular weight of about 27,000. Uh, 2700, I'm sorry, 2700. And the uh, when you, uh, when you uh, mix it or react it with, uh, with uh, it, it, uh, I guess, uh, polyvinyl alcohol, uh, the resulting uh, agglomeration, uh, uh, you're saying that it's about 300 nanometers and so, uh, so forth. Uh, it, is that kind of an encapsulation effect? Uh, it, the abstract says it's a covalent bonding. Well, that would cause more more problems than uh, because because something has to break the bonds. So the the covalent bonding is between the naloxone and the polylactic acid. That's the polymer. So when you add that to the polyvinyl alcohol solution in water, so that, that that acts as a stabilizer for the nanoparticle formation. So that's just uh, not, that's non equivalently absorbed onto the surface of the, the particles and stabilizes it. And that's then removed later during the purification process, or most of it's removed later during the purification process. And then what's breaking the bonds is going to be uh, either enzymes in the body or just uh, ester hydrolysis uh, in, the, in water and release. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good morning, Mario Linares from Float and Star Outreach. Um, I would like to know a little bit about the human side of the research. How long it took for you to get there, how many people were involved, and uh, how much there is still to develop uh, upon it. So I have an excellent team of collaborators and, uh, and postdocs that work on this. Um, a postdoc Andrew Kasich and Rina Kovalev spent about um, w uh, working on this project, and then Benedict Kolber and Mike Fiesel at uh, ben and Duquesne University is doing a lot of the animal testing, and Mike Fiesel works at uh, and some more to the opioid toxicology. The process itself took about, uh, my lab's been working in opioids for approximately uh, three and a half years, and we started working on the naloxone project when we realized how bad fentanyl was from a toxicity standpoint and how much how prolific its use has become. We were actually working on long-acting pain medicines, um, invol actually inv involving opioid derivatives, and we realized the proliferation of fentanyl, it, it, there's no way that this isn't gonna be a national crisis, and so we wanted to make, um, longer lasting antidotes to counteract the lifetime of fentanyl and the potency of fentanyl. And so then a part of that, re uh, then the part of the research came, how do we actually accomplish that goal? So we're able to sort of use the systems for pain management and turn translate them into a um, better system for delivering the antidotes. And, but it, you have, there's a lot of optimization because the polymers, the mounts and naloxone we needed and the way we had to make the system was totally different. So we had to change a lot of the polymer processing side of things and synthesis. So Katie Cottingham from ACS. So how does nanoparticle size influence the, uh, the antidote's properties? Does that have an effect? So yeah, the bigger the surface area of the material, the slower the degradation, uh, the faster the degradation rate because you have more access to enzymes. So the smaller the particles, the uh, faster uh, naloxone release. And so that's one of those properties that we're actually looking at now is to the, that effect and then what that effect looks like in, in, uh, in animal models. And when would this antidote be available to physicians and first responders? That's uh, it's a it's a long ways off. <laughs> it's like Have you done clinical trials yet, or anything? no? That's it's one, it's unfortunately it's it's going to be a, a very long ways away. Um, yeah. Any other questions? 
All right, thank you. The archive version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore Orlando 2019. Please join us for our next press conference at 9.30 a.m. today on smart pajamas that can monitor and help improve sleep. Thank you.